Put your hands up. Show me your hands. Show me. Were you scared? Yes, sir. Why were you scared? Because I seen my auntie crying, so I thought it had to be something serious. When did you find out about what happened to your auntie? After a couple of days when I stayed with my mama. When she came and got me from the place. And what did you find out it happened? I seen she so when I seen she went to my mama and asked her, is that true? Did you find out it was true? Yes, sir. How did that make you feel? I was very upset. That was eight-year-old Zion Carr narrating the terrifying moment his auntie, 28-year-old Atatiana Jefferson, was murdered right inside her mother's house by a law enforcement officer. That night, this neighbor, James Smith, noticed that Atatiana's front door was open in the middle of the night. So, he decided to call the authorities to conduct a welfare check on the family. However, things took a dark turn when the two dispatched officers arrived at the scene, and one of them, Officer Aaron Dean, pulled out his gun and fired at Atatiana through a bedroom window. People say, well, James, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. <laughs> but I made a call. I made the call because I thought that they were going to do what I called them to do. Check on my neighbor. In the aftermath of this horrific incident, Aaron Dean claimed he was just defending himself because he said Atatiana was armed with a gun during that confrontation. However, five years later, people are still asking, how does a non-emergency call for a front door check lead to the death of an innocent woman right inside her mother's home while playing games with her little nephew? Was this really a case of self-defense, or did Aaron Dean intentionally this woman because she was black. This is the tragic case of Atatiana Jefferson. In this video, we'll briefly look at Atatiana's background and then move on to the night of the tragic incident. After that, we'll look at Aaron Dean's background to see if there's anything in his past that could give us an idea of the kind of things he's capable of doing. From there, we'll then proceed to the trial and sentencing. Uh, when my vision cleared, then I observed the person. <laughs> that we now know is Miss Jefferson. I heard her scream and, and saw her fall like this. And I, I knew that, that I'd felt that person. How smart is it to shoot a gun at a target without knowing what's behind the target? I took a well-aimed shot with ammunition that's designed not to over-penetrate. How smart is it to take a shot at a target without knowing what's behind the target. It's not. You're trained against that, aren't you? Yes. Born on November 28, 1990, Atatiana Jefferson was someone who had always dreamed big. She had a burning passion for everything science, and it was this passion that led her to Louisiana, where she earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry with a focus on pre-med studies. Her ultimate goal, however, was to become a physician, a dream that carried her through long study hours and hard work. But life, as it often does, took an unexpected turn. After graduating, Atatiana returned to Fort Worth not to pursue medical school right away, but to care for her mother, who had fallen ill. Family came first for Atatiana, and though her aspirations were put on hold, she didn't abandon them. She found a job in pharmaceutical equipment sales, a role that allowed her to save money for her future studies while staying close to her mother. The night of October 12, 2019, started out like any other for Atatiana. She was at home on East Allen Avenue, a street she knew well, where her presence brought a sense of comfort and familiarity. That night, she wasn't alone. Her eight-year-old nephew, Zion Carr, was with her. The two of them were close, sharing a bond that was strengthened by moments like these, just an aunt and her nephew spending time together. As the evening wore on, they decided to make hamburgers. The smell of sizzling meat filled the kitchen. But things didn't go quite as planned. The hamburgers burned, and soon the house was filled with smoke. Trying to clear the air, they opened both the front and side doors, letting the cool night breeze sweep through the house. Now, because those hamburgers were burning, what'd you do with those doors? What'd you and Aunt Tay do with those doors that night? So the front, we forgot the front door was open, and the screen door was still kind of open when I opened the window off it. So y'all kind of open up the doors to let the smoke out? Yes, sir. 
It was late, around 2.24 in the morning, when a neighbor, James Smith, noticed something unusual. The front door of Atatiana's house was wide open. This was out of the ordinary, especially at this hour. Concerned for the safety of those inside, James called the authorities. I wasn't really sure of what was going on. It, wasn't, it didn't appear to be an emergency. He told the dispatcher that both cars were in the driveway, but the door was open, which didn't sit right with him because he hadn't seen them leave their door open like that before, especially in the middle of the night. Officers Aaron Dean and Carol Darch were assigned to check out the situation. The call they received described an open structure, which could mean anything from a simple oversight to something far more serious. As they arrived at the house, they noticed what the neighbor had described. The front door was open, and then they noticed the side door was open as well. The house was quiet, almost eerily so. No one greeted them, and no movement could be seen from where they stood outside. Instead of announcing themselves or knocking on the door, as one might expect, Aaron Dean, who was the lead officer, took a different approach. The officer did not announce that he was a police officer prior to shooting. What the officer observed and why he did not announce police will be addressed as the investigation continues. He walked around to the backyard, his flashlight cutting through the darkness. He was searching for any sign of trouble, any clue that could explain the open doors. Inside the house, Atatiana and Zion had moved to the back room. They were playing video games, a pastime they were using to wind down the evening after their little cooking mishap in the kitchen. But the peace of the moment they were sharing was suddenly interrupted when Atatiana heard something, a noise coming from outside. She was obviously alerted by the strange noise because she was unaware of the officer's presence around the house. So, naturally, she thought a prowler might be somewhere around trying to get into the house without knowing it was actually the officers. What were you doing when your aunt heard that noise? I was still playing on my Nintendo Switch. How did you know your aunt heard a noise? Because she told me, did you hear it? And I said no. Concerned for her and nephew's safety, she reached for her pistol, which she legally owned and was trained to use. She had a concealed carry permit and always kept the gun within easy reach inside her purse, right next to her work table. Was the lights on? Were the lights on in that bedroom? Yes, sir. And what did, after she told you she heard a noise, what did she do? She went to get her weapon in her purse. Where was her purse? Uh, next to her table where she worked at. Before she heard that noise outside, where was your aunt Tay sitting? Was she at that desk? Uh, no, she was in the middle of the room with her, like, she had her chair in the middle of the room playing on the game. And so you said she went to her purse and grabbed out a weapon. <coughs> what do you mean by weapons, Ion? <coughs> was it a big, long gun or a gun that you can hold in your hand? A gun to hold in your hand. As she retrieved the gun, Atatiana moved towards the window, trying to closely observe her surroundings to see where that noise was coming from. And where did she go with that, with the, uh, after she picked up? She was about to start walking to the window. Okay. And when she walked to the window, what did she do? Uh, I didn't hear nothing after that. I just seen her fell on the floor. And how close did Aunt Kay get to the window? Okay. She got pretty close to the window? Yes, sir. Was she saying anything to you as she got closer to the window? No, sir. What did you... What did... Uh, did you hear anything as she got closer to the window? No, sir. Her nephew Zion, who carefully watched his auntie's every move that night, said during an initial interview that Atatiana raised the gun slightly as she approached the window. However, during the trial, he later said she was just holding the gun by her side as a precaution rather than a threat. Zion said she never raised the gun and never pointed it toward the window. And did you see her go to her purse and get that gun? Yes, sir. And what did, what did she do after she grabbed, she took the gun out of her purse? She just held it to her side. She just like, she didn't point it up. She just kept it next to her, like on her side. Okay, I want to go back just a little bit. Do you remember that night, after all this was over with, going to talk to a, to a lady at a special place in a little bitty room? No, sir. We talked about this before. Her name was Lindsay Dula, and you wouldn't talk about what happened? Like when you took me? Yes. Oh, yes, sir. 
And he went and talked to that lady and told her everything about what happened, right? Yes, sir. Um, did you see, whenever your Aunt Tay walked towards the window with the gun, did you see her kind of pull the gun up just a little bit away from her side? Yes, sir. When we talked before, you said that she did kind of pull the gun up a little bit. Do you remember that? Honestly, you can't blame this boy for not remembering every detail of the terrifying events of that night because his recollections were understandably mixed given the intense situation. Even an adult wouldn't remember every detail of such events. Anyway, when Officer Aaron Dean reached the window where Aratiana stood, his flashlight went through the window and found a figure in the darkness inside the house. In an instant, he shouted verbal commands, put your hands up, show me your hands. I saw the silhouette. I'm just looking right down the barrel of a gun. And when I saw the barrel of that gun pointed at me, and I fired a single shot from my duty weapon. Those commands and the gunfire that followed were nearly simultaneous. In less than a second, he fired a single bullet through the window. Put your hands up! Show me your hands! The bullet struck a Tatiana in the chest, the force of it driving deep into her body until it lodged in her back. The silence that followed was deafening. Aaron Dean and his partner quickly entered the house to behold the scene of tragic devastation. They found Aratiana on the floor, near the window, crying and fighting for her life. Unfortunately, Aratiana Jefferson didn't survive the night. Her life, full of promise and dreams, yet to be fulfilled, was cut short in the most heartbreaking of ways by this officer. Fort Worth Police released Dean's personnel file after the shooting, shedding some light on his life prior to 2019. It shows that two supervisors during his training were concerned about Dean getting tunnel vision and not observing everything around him. One of them wrote, he will be so engrossed with what he's doing, he gets tunnel vision and will not hear what's being instructed. Born on October 27, 1984, Aaron Dean's life journey has had its fair share of ups and downs. His path led him to the Fort Worth area, where he eventually became a law enforcement officer. But before then, in 2004, something happened that would leave a mark on Dean's life. At that time, he was a student at the University of Texas at Arlington, spending time in the campus library like many other students. But on this particular day, Dean, for some reason best known to him, touched a female student's breast. This inappropriate behavior led to him being cited for assault by contact. As you might already know, this wasn't a minor issue. It was considered a Class C misdemeanor, to which Dean pleaded no contest, and as a result, he was convicted. On that application and in his interview, he said that while he was a student at UT Arlington in 2004, he was given a citation by Arlington police after he touched a female student's breast while in the library and then asked she not report it to police. I was in a uh, very conservative church at the time, you know, worried about tarring and feathering and all that. Fort Worth police said in a statement they weighed the assault charge when deciding to hire him. It was given significant scrutiny during the hiring process. Years passed, and Dean decided to pursue a career in law enforcement. In March 2018, he achieved a significant milestone by graduating from the Fort Worth Police Academy. It was a moment of pride for him, a new beginning in a career he believed would allow him to serve and protect his community. Just a month later, Aaron Dean officially joined the Fort Worth Police Department, ready to take on the responsibilities of a police officer. However, before Dean could don the prestigious law enforcement uniform and badge, there was one crucial step he had to complete, a mental health evaluation. This is a standard procedure for many in law enforcement, designed to ensure those entrusted with authority are mentally and emotionally prepared for the challenges ahead. The evaluation, though, didn't go as smoothly as Dean might have hoped. The mental health professional who assessed him noted some concerning traits in his personality. The clinician observed that Aaron Dean had a tendency toward grandiosity, believing himself to be more important or capable than others. He was also seen as domineering, someone who liked to control situations and people around him, and over-controlling, which meant he often tried to dictate the behavior of others beyond what might be considered reasonable. These traits, coupled with what the clinician described as a narcissistic personality style, raised red flags. The clinician expressed concerns that these aspects of Dean's personality could lead to difficulties in his decision-making and judgment, particularly in high-pressure situations where quick thinking and empathy are crucial. 
The evaluation went further, suggesting that Aaron might be at risk of engaging in behaviors that could put both himself and others at risk. The clinician even described him as verbally aggressive, someone who might use words as weapons in confrontations, which is not an ideal trait for someone in law enforcement. Interestingly, Aaron's case was not clear-cut. While one clinician saw these potential issues, three other mental health professionals who evaluated him around the same time didn't share the same concerns. They believed Aaron was perfectly fine, which highlights how subjective mental health evaluations can be. However, two of those mental health professionals made a very crucial observation about Dean. It shows that two supervisors during his training were concerned about Dean getting tunnel vision and not observing everything around him. One of them wrote, he will be so engrossed with what he's doing, he gets tunnel vision and will not hear what's being instructed. So, at the end of the day, there was no unanimous agreement about the kind of person Aaron Dean really was. But going by the first clinician's assessment, Dean's dominant and aggressive tendencies were tied to narcissism, a combination that could make someone not just assertive, but also dangerously entitled. When such a person is given authority, like that of a law enforcement officer, with the power to make life and death decisions, the potential for misuse of that power becomes a real concern. The department also released video of his job interview where he was asked this. Will you be able to kill somebody if you have to? No problem. So, with how Aaron Dean acted in this case, it is most likely that the first clinician who assessed him years back was very right about his personality. He also had two run-ins with police in 2005 involving an airsoft pistol he carried on his hip that made one restaurant customer nervous, Dean wrote. An officer responded and gave me a stern warning for my recklessness and disturbance of everyone's day. If Aaron Dean had followed his law enforcement training and done everything right that night, a Tatiana Jefferson would still be alive today. She really didn't have to die that night, but it was just so unfortunate that her paths crossed with the wrong officer that night. Black Lives Matter! Her death sparked outrage and protests across the city. I'm here to let you know your city is hurting. Aaron Dean was arrested two days after Atatiana Jefferson's murder. However, he was released on a $200,000 bond just hours after his arrest. His trial was delayed multiple times, but finally began in December 2022, more than three years after Atatiana's murder. Terry, this case has been delayed multiple times. Why was that the case, and do you think that's going to affect an upcoming trial? Well, the delays were different delays. The first delay was COVID, and that was all the cases that we were seeing. There was about a year delay for that. But then after that, defense counsel moved to recuse the judge. They moved to remove the trial to another venue. And they basically just used every tactic they possibly could to delay. It was set for June, and then after that, they said the judge wasn't being fair, and then they set it for just this past week. So I definitely think that justice has been delayed, evidence grows cold, the victims and their family aren't going to be able to get, you know, some sort of closure until this trial is over. Aaron Dean took the stand during his own trial and told the jury that on the night of the tragic incident, he thought the house was burglarized. I see a kid. Of course, it's, you know, we know it's Zion. And I'm thinking, who brings a kid to a burglary? What is going on? Dean appeared very emotional as he took the stand during this testimony. He gave a step-by-step -step account of the moments leading up to the point when he pulled the trigger that took Atatiana Jefferson's life on October 12, 2019. The stand during this testimony, according to him, he and his partner Carol Darch approached the open front and side doors. It looked like items had been pulled out. It looked like someone had gone through the cabinets and the drawers uh, looking for, for valuables to steal. What was going through your mind at this point? That we had a possible burglary at that time. Dean said that they moved along the side of the home quickly, checking two, the vehicles that were parked outside and the detached garage before opening the backyard gate and approaching a window. That was when Dean said he saw what looked like the silhouette of a person very close to the window. As I looked through that window, Low in the window, I observed a person. Couldn't tell black, white, male, female. And saw the silhouette again. And I was shouting at this time, shouting commands. Uh, put up your hands, show me your hands, show me your hands. And as I started to get that second phrase out, show me your hands, 
That was when Dean claimed he feared for his life because he was staring down at a gun barrel. So, he fired his duty weapon in self-defense at the strange figure behind the window. I saw the silhouette. I was looking right down the barrel of a gun. And when I saw the barrel of that gun pointed at me, and I fired a single shot from my duty weapon and immediately had the the flash from the muzzle reflecting off the off the window and of course uh, as my weapon recoiled the light was bouncing back in my face so I couldn't see uh, when my vision cleared then I observed the person that we now know as Miss Jefferson I heard her scream and, and saw her fall like this and I, I knew that that I'd Person. To justify his actions that night, Dean said that his law enforcement training did not allow him to hesitate when confronted with deadly force. Speaking of his law enforcement training, Prosecutor Dale Smith, during his cross-examination, grilled Dean about several moments where he threw caution to the wind and did not follow his law enforcement training. How smart is it to shoot a gun at a target without knowing what's behind the target? I took a well-aimed shot with ammunition that's designed not to over-penetrate. How smart is it to take a shot at a target without knowing what's behind the target? It's not. You're trained against that, aren't you? Yes. Smith also questioned Dean about his next moves as he approached the window with the suspicion that there was a burglary at the scene that night. You tried to open the window to get inside a house where you didn't know where unknown assailants could be hiding that could be armed. Is that what you're telling this jury? Yes. The prosecutor was able to establish that Dean was not following proper law enforcement procedure because he intended to get into the house without properly assessing the threat to know who was in the house, their position, and if they were armed. Is that good police work? No. Even though Dean claimed he had seen a Tatiana pointing a gun at him that night before he fired his weapon, he never told his partner that there was a gun. After firing his own weapon, Dean led his partner into the apartment without minding if there were other individuals with guns inside the house, since he claimed he thought there was an ongoing burglary inside the home. Did you tell her there was a gun? I did not. Is that good police work? No. That's more bad police work, isn't it? Yes. It's more bad police work, isn't it? It's not the best. There's probably things I could have done better. Even though Dean refused to announce his presence as a law enforcement officer to alert anyone in the house to his presence, he went on to use his flashlight around the private property, which contradicts his earlier decision not to identify himself as an officer. All this other stuff that you didn't want to announce your presence, that's when you decide to announce your presence. Right then, through that back window, in someone's own backyard, in a private citizen's backyard, through a gate that was shut, back there through a window, now is finally when you decide to announce your presence because I thought we had a burglary. And you didn't announce your presence with Fort PD, did you? You just used your flashlight, correct? No, I just used my flashlight. And whoever was in that house had no idea, did they? I don't know. Before leaving the stand, the prosecutor asked Dean to score himself from A to F based on his job as a trained law enforcement officer on the night of that incident, despite initially admitting that he did a lot of bad police work that night and that there were many things he could have done better. Dean scored himself a B. Probably a B. A B? High passing grade. What do you think you did the best? Not sure. You gave yourself a B and you can't tell this jury what you did the best? After Dean gave his testimony, the defense brought a forensic video analyst to the stand, hoping to strengthen their case. This expert claimed that Dean had a clearer view of the scene than what the body camera footage captured, but the real twist came during the cross-examination. The defense's expert was pressed on a crucial point. Just how fast did the Dean fire at Jefferson? Was it before he told her to raise her hands or while he was still in the process of giving the command? The expert admitted that the difference was razor thin, just about half a second. So, what this means is that Dean was almost firing his weapon at the same time he was giving his verbal commands. He didn't even give this woman just enough time 
to respond to his commands before he pulled the trigger and murdered her. When Dean's partner, Carol Darch, took the witness stand during his trial, she also claimed that they believed that there was an ongoing burglary inside the house that night. When you looked inside the house, you saw it appeared to be ransacked, correct? Yes. So at that point, what were you thinking was going on in your mind? A burglary. Unlike Dean, who showed a bit of remorse for his actions, Officer Carol Darch appeared to be very proud of how she and her partner handled the case that night. You meet deadly force with deadly force and you're trained to stop the threat. And she said that with a smirk on her face. That just tells you that this woman would have done the same if she had been in Dean's position that night. Anyway, what would be the most crucial moment in this trial came when Aditiana's nephew, Zion, took the stand to tell the jury all he saw and heard on the night of that incident. What were you doing when your aunt Tay heard that noise? I was still playing on my Nintendo Switch. How did you know your aunt Tay heard a noise? Because she told me, did you hear it? And I said no. Was the lights on, were the lights on in that bedroom? Yes, sir. And what did, after she told you she heard a noise, what did she do? She went to get her weapon out of her purse. Where was her purse? Uh, next to her table where she worked at. Before she heard that noise outside, where was your auntie sitting? Was she at that desk? Uh, no, she was in the middle of the room with her, like, she had her chair in the middle of the room playing on the game. And so you said she went to her purse and grabbed out a weapon. What do you mean by weapon, Zion? Oh. Was it a big long gun or a gun that you can hold in your hand? A gun you can hold in your hand. After Tatiana heard the noises and retrieved her gun, Zion said she held the gun by her side and did not at any time point it toward the window, as Dean claimed. And did you see her go to her purse and get that gun? She just hold it to her side. She just like, she didn't point it up. She just kept it next to her, like on her side. However, Zion was reminded that he had initially said during an interview that his auntie had slightly raised the gun above her head. But Zion said he didn't remember saying so. He maintained that his auntie never raised or pointed the weapon towards the window. Okay, I'm gonna go back just a little bit. Do you remember that night after all this was over with, going to talk to a, to a lady at a special place in a little bitty room? No, sir. We talked about this before. Her name was Lindsay Dula, and you wouldn't talk about what happened? Like when he took me? Yes. Oh, yes, sir. And you wouldn't talk to that lady and told her everything about what happened, right? Yes, sir. Um, did you see, whenever your Aunt Tay walked towards the window with the gun, did you see her kind of pull the gun up just a little bit away from her side? No, sir. Now, when we talked before, you said that she did kind of pull the gun up a little bit. Do you remember that? No, sir. It's okay if you remember it. If you, I mean, I just want you to remember it exactly the way you do. Do you remember if she had the gun up or down? Down. Now, are you sure she didn't have it up at all? No, sir. Zion said he didn't hear or see anything else that night. He just saw his auntie walking towards the window after retrieving her gun, and in the blink of an eye, she fell to the ground and started crying. And where did she go with that, with the, uh, after she picked up? She was about to start walking to the window. Okay. And when she walked to the window, what did she do? Uh... I didn't hear nothing after that. I just seen her fell on the floor. And how close did Aunt Tay get to the window? I can't, uh, I don't know how to, like, say how far she was. Like, I say, like, she was, like, three feet away. Okay. She got pretty close to the window? Yes, sir. Was she saying anything to you as she got closer to the window? No, sir. What did you, what did, uh, did you hear anything as she got closer to the window? No, sir. Did you see something that happened? I seen her fell on the ground. Did you see what was, what, did you see anything outside the window? No, sir. You didn't see a man with a badge? No, sir. Did you hear anything before she fell to the ground? No, sir. What happened after she fell to the ground? She started crying and then 
after that, two police officers came and got me. When Zion saw his auntie fall to the ground and started crying, he said he had no idea what was going on, but he just knew that something bad had happened to his auntie. Did you know what had happened at that point? No, sir. Did you know if your auntie was hurt? Yes, sir. What were you thinking? I was thinking, is it a dream? How did you think she was hurt? Because she was crying and just shaking. What happened when the, the two police then came into the bedroom? They seen me and they took they told me to get up and they took me to the back of a police car. After the incident, Officer Dean and his partner did not bother to render any form of help to Atatiana. They just left her there to die while they escorted Zion to the back of their patrol vehicle. Did one police officer take you or both of them? Both of them. Both of them? Are you sure it wasn't just the woman police officer? No, sir. Like, the man, he walked a little bit, but then the lady told him, like, to go check on her. Like, when we got halfway, like, right there by the kitchen, so he did. Repeat what you just said. So she oh, she told the man to go check on her. She, go check on my auntie to see if she was still alive. And he said, okay. Did you know if your auntie was still alive at that point? Yes, sir. You can't imagine how scared this little boy must have been, witnessing something so terrifying happen to her loved one. Are you scared? Yes, sir. Why were you scared? Because I seen my auntie crying, so... I thought it had to be something serious. It would have been until a few days later that would learn about what actually happened to his auntie. When did you find out about what happened to your auntie? After a couple of days when I stayed with my mama. When she came and got me from the place. And what did you find out it happened? I seen she died. So when I seen she died, I went to my mama and asked her, is that true? Did you find out it was true? Yes, sir. How'd that make you feel? I was very upset. To date, Atatiana's neighbor, who made that 911 call to the house that night, still beats himself up because he feels that if he hadn't called the cops to the apartment that night, Atatiana Jefferson would still be alive today. People say, well, James, it's not your fault. You're not your fault. <laughs> but I made a call. I made the call because I thought that they were going to do what I called them to do. Check on my neighbor. And they didn't do that. Dean's trial lasted about 10 days, and in the end, the jury reached a verdict. Aaron Dean was found not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. The sentence handed down was 11 years and 10 months in prison, a decision that some felt was just, while others believed it fell short of what Atatiana's life was worth. Do you think manslaughter is the right conviction for this case? Or do you think Aaron Dean is guilty of murder? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay safe.